Welcome to the 39th episode of Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, Poet Laureate of Connecticut and Simsbury, and I am delighted to present bi-monthly SCTV readings by some of the area's finest poets, in conjunction with producer Ken Picard, whose artwork and pottery are behind and before me. Today I am very pleased to be joined by Susanna Lawrence. Susanna lives in northwestern Connecticut and holds an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Her work has appeared in many publications such as Nimrod, the Comstock Review, the Cortland Review, the MacGuffin, Poet Lore, and the anthology where Beach Meets Ocean, 10 Years of the Block Island Poetry Project. A lifelong environmental activist, she is the author of two of the two volume, Audubon Society Field Guide to the Natural Places of the Mid-Atlantic States. Today we will hear poems from her new Antrim House book, Just Above the Bone, and perhaps a few new ones, if we're lucky. Welcome to Speaking of Poetry, Susanna Lawrence. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Rennie. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you so much for all the help you gave me and all you do for Connecticut poets. So. So the first poem I'm going to read is a poem by Thomas Tronstromer. I like to start my readings with um, a piece by someone else, uh, and he is a poet that I much admire, and this is one that I think is appropriate to the reading. It's called Morning Birds. I wake in the car whose windshield is coated with pollen. I put on my sunglasses. The bird song darkens. Meanwhile, another man buys a paper at the railway station, close to a large goods wagon, which is all red with rust, and stands flickering in the sun. No blank space anywhere here. Straight through the spring warmth, a cold corridor where someone comes running and tells how, up at the head office, they slandered him. Through a back door in the landscape comes the magpie, black and white, and the blackbird darting to and fro till everything becomes a charcoal drawing except the white clothes on the wash line, a palestrina chorus. No blank space anywhere here. Fantastic to feel how my poem grows while I myself shrink. It grows. It takes my place. It pushes me aside. It throws me out of the nest. The poem is ready. So the first poem of my own collection that I'm going to read is called True Confessions in a Drafty Hotel. And this poem began its life on Block Island, as many of my poems did. Because someone below me hums a worn-in, night-colored song, black and white cigarette smoke in it, and a chantuzzi rue, the stars beyond the satellite litter meant to keep everyone in touch, draw closer than usual. Up through the floorboards, her vibrato shivers a tune I almost know, then do, climbs out of hum to purple-throated syllables. Night and day, you are the one. She fingers the low notes out, winds a precious, casual thread from closet to dresser to sink bluish stains on its white porcelain, just like mine, gathers out of calloused habit a torch song she might not believe in, loves anyway for its radiant ashes. Around the two of us she raises her sound house, attic window aimed skyward, deep notes welling from its cellar. I listen for her last steps, the beds groan, as if we were sisters, and she's just sneaked in, me longing to know who she's been with, what they've done. The second poem is, call, is called Verge, and it's the, also the name of the first section. And um, I think I don't need to say too much more about that. Sometimes at dusk, never morning, a bend in a road goes off. Dirt and stones a girl's walked all her life, unloosing a fear or a flutter in her face, moth wings soft. 
Silly, she says, knowing the curve arcs between the tame of road and field and people expecting her, one way, the other. Is it the shade-colored doves? What flies up at her feet, a wing whistle, an undermutter. A minute, less, and like perfume now, on her skin's bare swell, what she wants, what she doesn't, coming closer. This poem is called Careful What You Wish For, and I'm reading it because it, um, it indicates one of my concerns, which is uh, about where we are in the natural world and climate and climate change. As if he had a child in mind, the man on the dock had set his telescope low. So I didn't get at first what he wanted or why to look wisely into the sun. His round face, one I'd trust on the darker side of a road, gas station a mile off. So when he crooked his finger, I went close, bent under the black cloth, fitted my eye to the scope. The sun's flaming stare turned me dumb inside the lake's fuss of voices. His filter narrowed to red, light's full spectrum, all that fusing hydrogen aimed like something hunting for us. Spurts and threads of flare licked along its rim against space black, as if it could hear me breathing, its pulsing fire more like ruin. This poem is called Elm is to Oriole as Oriole is. Orioles all along the road to Canaan, working into the elms overhead, into the thinner stories, horsehair, grass, milkweed silk, twine and bast, their wispy nest marvels, 60 feet up, safe. On the way to school, past Holsteins, past fields, plowed and warming, spring new mown and manured, a sweet stink. Past meadows, the Friday night auction barn where the cheap horses used to jig the ring, led by boys in white t-shirts, their hands on the halter ropes, close under each chin, to keep the ponies good-mannered and moving. My mother bought a mare there once, sweet-mannered palomino with a foal inside her, a runty chestnut, always head-shy. We rode them, bare legs to rough-coated bellies, and fell off laughing into long grass. I'm not sure what went first, meadows or the elms, blight wood cut and burned with rotted planks from old coops, fences, cold frames, sparks the fire-coal glow of orioles spurting, fishtailing up to blackout. And then this spring, on a river sweeping between cottonwoods and bony sycamores, steering through flow, I see them, orioles, their weaving flight from tree to tree, hear each fluted note sustained, as if holding out. This poem is entitled, Is There, water, is there Still Water on Mars? I Want to Know at 3.30 a.m., looking up at the green eye of the smoke detector. Because springs known only to muzzles and tongues rise through clean sand and under ice, sunfish and pickerels shelter. Because her water's breaking, the girl in the dairy aisle, while outside clouds swell over dry wheat. Because monsoon and drizzle and hurricano spill from the same heaven, and the Atlantic bears blue whales, styrofoam, and the sweet-fleshed dorado. Because sweat rivers a miner's face and spits not choosy. Because Glen Canyon gossips to the Colorado's ghost. Because polar ice caps and poisoned wells lie under our jurisdiction, and we know more and less than we admit to. Because hydrogen and oxygen can't resist each other, and that last trickle down your parched throat will be a desperate move. Because water 
won't hold sweet for too long. Still we'll call it sweet. This poem is called Souvenir. The box's glassy skin, blood colored, vein blood, that dark, lacquered layers netted with scarlet hatchings, first seen in a Bangkok shop, its window a narrow street away from the hotel where the foreign press corps used to drink, cracking jokes by the pool. That was long ago, and no longer famous, the hotel stood half empty now, the water odorous, like damp clothes left in a hot car. You and I showered after one swim, worried what we could catch from it. In the shop, you loved the smell of old wood. Fine once, the box drifts, ruining on a formica counter cluttered with dusty papers, unread books, a plastic ashtray. Pieces of lacquer fall away, cracked, split like my fingers in these New England winters, dry desert within cold desert. Almost nothing weighs little enough to keep in it. Names, maybe, but whose? Light like the hummingbird, too light to pass through a window. I hold its hollow bone body, turning my hand to see the ruby flash at its throat. This next poem is called Danjou for One, and just to remind you, a Danjou is a kind of pear, although that becomes clear at the end. This afternoon, red wine dark and oaks russet slipped over gray hills where north is away. You aren't here to see this one maple spill, a last blood orange out loud, or the downy grass still green, wet, go dry. I wish I could tell you how this light floats as over orchard wind unravels like smoke ten geese or how, when I bite this ripe pear, slurping its sweet over the steel sink, I have to lick my hand. So this next poem is about living in a small town. And when you live in a small town, as I do, people's stories intersect, sometimes on a very intimate level and sometimes at the edges, but they intersect often. After hours at the eagle's nest. A drunk still hangs at the bar. Behind it, Will, just old enough to be legal, wants him gone, clears the glasses, parks his voice in neutral, says, closing time, thinks old fart. He should maybe call someone to pick him up. It's the worst of a good job. The wrecks who can't hold life together without enough liquor to trash them. He remembers that girl, the one in his brother's class, her hair a black lake, the one your eyes wanted to follow, clipped from behind by someone too wasted to know where the edge lay, too slow to swerve. All those lives burnt, trees lightning struck, the girl and her scorched parents, the driver. He offers the guy a ride. Outside, the air feels snow coming. Under a street light, the drunk turns to him. Thanks, he says, and Will knows him now, remembers him. Mr. Clark yelling to his kid at bat, get a piece of it, Jimmy. Remembers himself covering first, and Will says, no problem. Starts the car, lets it run a minute. The two of them quiet in the cold, their breath clouding. The name of this poem is Hitting Peak Color. These narrow roads, unruly curves, black ice turns them brutal. A boy from town and his girlfriend, a little late, the startled doe, a woman almost home, lulled by her life's hum into a white ash. But now, both hands high, mouth wide, a small girl tries to catch a leaf as it floats and jinks away from her. How hard that was and how I loved Dizzy then, the world turning, me still. The air tastes of cold water in a metal cup. 
Brazen light pings against houses, stone walls, the firebird maples. Mushrooms rise like dinner rolls from fissured trunks overnight. All of us seem taller walking along, as if gravity's backed off for now. On the road to the dentist or the airport, plastic flowers and mylar balloons shrine phone poles and trees. They flash past like floaters, there and not there. We love you, Lori. Scott, rest in peace. How long do they keep at it, the mothers, the fathers, changing wreaths to tulips to asters? A field pales toward deeper fall, one maples in flames against the pines, ragged green. So this song, <laughs> this song, this poem is written um, for my son, who is now in his 20s, but this was written earlier. The rules, the exceptions. Not hard to say, watch out for, and mean cars, their white and red, night streaming too fast, the pedal to the floor, or the river road, the water's oily, unforgiving glitter, or liquor's jolt, a shot's afterburn, needles. Odd to say, careful, and still want for him travel overland, bowls of spiced rice and tart oranges at a roadside, small hot fires, music in an unlit night, 4 a.m. bus stops, borders crossed. No words to tell, water's cool, giddy in your own sweat-soaked hair, whispered laughter in a night garden, empty early streets washed, and over your bare shoulders, a sudden astringent clarity, the hot smell of coffee and the river under. This, this is a poem written in, in memory of my mother and father. I'm not sure what they'd think of it, but it's all right. Nantucket, Sunday, August 25th, 1948. Seven miles, visibility, fog lifted from 10 a.m. steeples, brassy peels, pearl. Tourists, a couple stands, sings together in a sun-washed church, inside the stark white vow, years old now. Midday, white sand burns, Dried kelp litters the tide line, just the two of them in the hammered ocean beyond the breakers of Dion off Dionis Beach. Their white toes poke up, they float and bump, smile, through them a rolling like waves. Later, the half hour before dinner light, the cherry wood bed, just them, salty skinned, sun rough, making me. He brushes with his foot sand from her toes and ankle and arch, invisible beyond their window, sharp-eyed gulls, yawp and wheel, higher and higher. This next poem is for my brother, who died too young at the age of 21 a long time ago. Stepping over the property line. I stumbled across a car hood upended in the woods, a powdery blue spangled with holes. In a small town, there's always someone ready to lie. Lately, that's me. The local dogs bark when I get too near. I pretend to throw a stone. They pretend to retreat. My friend's chemo has flooded her street, water lapping at her upper floors. Everything is getting better except what isn't, sunny day after sunny day. If you lose a brother young, you carry him like glass only so far into the future. These skinny woods are nothing like the burnt cathedrals where fire has eaten centuries overnight. Did you know we can record our last words on a website so our voices last forever? A good thing? Yesterday, I borrowed my brother's 22, each new hole a tiny window. I loved making the small bead fit into the notch, not letting my breath go too soon. 
So I'm going to read now one of my newer poems um, that's not in the collection. And this is called Borrowed Landscapes. A world gathers into itself, mountain tucked into hill, lake tucked into pond, in this Japanese garden, the long road to the western hills wound down into a curl of stones under mannered pines, shorn to limit lushness, to rope in what surges. Even the rain dripping from eaves and one woman's azalea pink umbrella restrains itself. At the tea house door, our big shoes lie against smaller ones like boats crowding a dock on the edge of a green bay. At the Museum of Natural History, my mother took me to see the dioramas, a mountain meadow where the stuffed wapiti lifted its antlered head to sniff invisible wind, a forest glade where Algonquin women scraped away at a stretched hide or carried a bundle of wood, never burning it. And if I could just walk through glass, everything would come to life, and I would know the secret no adult ever grasps. But always the moment passed, and we went for ice cream, or visited my great aunt, who fed us shortbread, loved fire engines, and pulled for the Dodgers without ever leaving her apartment, which smelled of polished wood and in spring lilacs. Here, one cherry tree offers its pink song. Almost we catch the tune before the mist drowns it out. This poem is also for my brother who died so long ago. And it's entitled, There's No Word for Blue in the Odyssey. I know this photo of you, your face at 15, already roughed up beyond boy into tougher glamour that skeptical right eye and those summer props, lake and hemlocks. It's not me, your little sister, but someone no longer there you see behind the lens you're coming and not coming toward. Your voice sounds just beyond reach, like wind shimmying leaves beyond a closed window. What would you say to me? What would you say? There are tribes who know the sky's color is black, no words can make them see it's blue. Cool as the breeze at your back, you breathe its water scent, its hint of fishiness. Even then, your country only bordered me. How you are young, still young in my hands. My skin like ruched paper, folded and folded and folded. You've seeped into air like a candle's unburned smoke, leave traces your white shirt sleeve, your wild flying a jeep down Route 63, your knuckle-hard punches in my eight-year-old arm, frog in my jeans, its cool, frantic body against my skin, and your almost last words, soft and clear in my ear, Wellesley yet. Memory darkens, then pales like watered sand. The word brother clangs shut, too heavy to hold up for long. How unaccountable and stony are our old photographs of the loved and the dead. What might they see in us? On July's green and blue film, you are smiling. Nothing can hurt your sly happiness. So the last poem I'm going to read is called for my husband, Wiley, and it's called Who's Got Them Now? That second first time I saw you, I wanted to be wearing red shoes, red heels, brazen and shout red, no backing out of, no retreat to red, the red of yes and look right here. So I ran into the first pair I saw after, feet aching for strut, for swivel and shunt under a short leather skirt and spiky dance tunes, the two of us unskeptical with shy lust under the influence of my red shoes. So why did I give them up, those red shoes, before the heels wore down, before the soles took in water? On longer voyages, does everything settle into then or was? Do I miss them always or just now, just here? There, there they go, working some beat, 
music slipping past like faster water, like lighter than air. You remember how I felt in them, don't you? Thank you for that reading. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled and filled with poetry as a result. And uh, if, if uh, Tranströmer is right that our poems push us out of the nest, I love where yours pushed you. Uh, you grounded yourself beautifully. And uh, I, I, I just enjoy so much that there's never less than truth telling. You don't pull any punches. And yet over and over again, the truth of beauty returns after the truth of loss. And um, I'm thinking about those Orioles that were there after all, mm. although all seemed lost. Uh, the water, despite its going south, is still sweet. Mm. Uh, and, and Will, after calling that drunk in the bar an old fart, comes to his aid and realizes he knows him and appreciates him. And there's, there's such love in, in that moment. And, and uh, so few uh, have written so well about their own conception. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then to have that wonderful detail, because you, your poems are full of wonderful details, that after that moment, that beachside moment of conception, your father uh, eases the, the, salt, the sand and salt from your mother's skin. I just thought that was such a touching and true uh, detail. Yeah, I, I think you must have been there in some way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for that Thank uh, you, Rennie. grand uh, series of poems. And uh, also thanks to Karen Handville, the enormously talented station manager of SCTV, and to Ken Picard, who produces and edits this show and whose artwork graces its set. If you would like to learn more about Susanna Lawrence's poetry and read samples from her book, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may also be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye for now until we meet again next month for the 40th installment of Speaking of Poetry.